Hey, welcome to River Rock Fellowship Online Services. I'm Pastor Marvin, and I just want to encourage everybody, um, go ahead and share us or like us or follow us. And if you're a guest, well, thanks for joining. Want to point you to rrf.church. Go there and check us out. Got some exciting news to share with everyone. We understand that, and I've looked on the internet there at ca.gov. That's the california.gov for the COVID-19. And we are finding out that we've gone from tier purple to tier red. What does that mean? It means that churches and a lot of other type of businesses are able to reopen with some precautions and guidelines to be in place as well. Of course, we're going to follow all of those as normal. So how are we going to open up in-person meetings and services as we go forward? We know some folks are wanting to take it a little slow and just be a little bit more precautious, and we understand that. Encourage you to bring your your mask when you would come. So this is the approach we're going to take. Starting this Tuesday, October 6th, again, this Tuesday, October 6th, at 6.30 p.m., we would have our Pray First gathering here at the church. Encourage you to come and bring your mask if you would like, and we will gather and have our time of celebrating and worshiping and praying here on Tuesday, October 6, 6.30 p.m. Then on Friday at 5.30 a.m., the men would meet and gather here at the church, and it would just be every Tuesday, every Friday going forward. Now, our Sunday in service, we would begin October the 18th. Again, Sunday, October 18th at 9.30 a.m. That will allow a few more weeks for people to feel a little bit more comfortable that the San Joaquin County really is on the right way of this COVID-19 and this pandemic. So we pray that you would feel free and excited to come and to gather. As the scripture tells us, do not forsake the fellowship of the saints. So look forward. I can't wait to see you guys. I'm sure you can't wait to see everybody else. And we will give the name of Jesus all the praise and glory he deserves. Well, folks, we also want to say thank you to your faithfulness and your time, your talent, and your treasure in giving to the River Rock Fellowship ministry. Without you, it doesn't happen. And because of that, we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. In just a little bit, there will be a slide, and it will show you the three different ways that you can give, and we thank you for that as well. But now, let's get ready for service. We're about to go into worship, and sometimes it's hard with online services. But I, I bet if you were to reach out and say, Lord, would you just do something in me today? I bet he will reach you right at your prayer, and you would be surprised. So let's gather together to worship in spirit and truth, even via technology. Will you pray with me? Well, Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that we're going to be able to gather together in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we would be able to trust you in all things. For greater is he that is in us than he that's in this world. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you're doing in the body of Christ. And we pray, Father, you would cause there to be growth in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's have church. Jesus 
Hey, welcome to part seven of our sermon series simply called The Ten Commandments. You know, if you're just joining us, we're approaching the Ten Commandments as though if they are real and relevant for us today. We're in part seven. We're looking at Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. This is the seventh commandment, and it says in just five words, you must not commit adultery. You know, in our flesh, in our human nature, we like to avoid commands. I mean, we don't like commands when we were kids, and we be quite honest with you, we don't like commands when we're adults. We don't like the words that say, you can't, or you must, or you shall. It just sounds harsh. And when we let our offended flesh have its own way, when we get offended like that, we'll, we'll just pass over the idea of thinking things through. In our flesh, in our self-centeredness, we want what we want when we want it, and we want it now. And how dare you command me to do anything? In that idea, we're not looking about tomorrow or a few years or a decade or a lifetime from now. We're not considering what would it be like if we obeyed this command from God and that there would be peace for a lifetime in our heart. That's one of the reasons why we've been looking at the Ten Commandments as a love letter from God to us. Father, He is a Father who cares about you and about me. And He cares about peace in your heart. Let's open up with some prayer. Well, Father God, I just thank you for your goodness and your grace. And I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't approach the Ten Commandments with, Lord, a a little angst in our heart but father maybe an openness that our heavenly father does care and does know what is best for us and for those we love lord your will your way in jesus holy name amen so here's the big question why did god choose to put the seventh commandment into the top 10 into the 10 commandments Well, before we get there, it might be good for us to know a few things before. The seventh commandment, which says you must not commit adultery. um, God is saying something incredibly obvious, even though he doesn't need to. But I think that obvious thing needs to be looked at. God is the one who created the institution of marriage. And marriage is to be treated as sacred see god established the institution of marriage as being between one man and one woman let's look at genesis chapter 2 verse 24 this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one that's incredibly important to see god instituted this let's look at a dictionary word the term adultery how does it define adultery well it says voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and someone other than her or his lawful spouse now the old testament would probably concur with that but sad to say there are some folks who would say to themselves well if we didn't do that intimate part according to that definition are we going to be okay well then i point you over to what jesus says right he says if you just look at her with lust you've already committed adultery we got to be careful how we try to wiggle our way around with this thing about sin so let's come back to the same the idea of reasons why god instituted the seventh commandment What was he thinking? What's going on there? Well, God created the holy estate of marriage to be the building block for a healthy, a strong, a growing family. And the marriage is to be reviewed, again, like I was saying, as something sacred. With our Heavenly Father placing such a high value on marriage 
It's no wonder God seeks to protect it from any kind of defilement. Let's go to Hebrews 13, verse 4. It, the author says, Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Now, here again we find the New Testament stating the importance of marriage and the importance of staying faithful. I want us to watch this, this little video. I want us to remember that the Ten Commandments are a love letter from our Heavenly Father to us. And that may be the reason He gave us the Seventh Commandment is because He knows something about the other side of unfaithfulness than maybe we do. Let's watch this. How you doing? Fine. I'm just trying to make sense of all of this. Trying to make sense out of what? I, I said I wanted you to stay. No, you don't. Yes, yes, I do. No, you don't. That's not what you said last night. <sighs> Madison. That was last night. That's when I found out about all this. That's when you confessed everything to me. I have humiliated you, us. Not to mention all of our friends and family and everybody at church. <laughs> telling what they're gonna say. No telling what they're gonna say and it really doesn't matter. Look, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. You've. You've humiliated me. You've turned my world upside down. You've crushed me. But through all of this, I'm saying, Maddie, stay. You can't. Why? I've never been more ashamed than I am right now. You can't possibly want me to stay. Do you love me? Yes. You still love him? That was never about love. Then stay. Stay. What's that? It's us. <laughs> oh. We're just little kids. Are we playing Mercy there? Yeah. You love playing Mercy? You loved anyone that would play with you to bend their hands back as far as you could. You would never give up. I was always the one that cried mercy. <laughs> yeah. I have bent you back so far, and you have yet to cry mercy, and I just don't understand that. I don't think it's about me crying mercy. As much as it, is, as it is showing your mercy, and and Madison, I, I don't even know how good I'm going to be at that. But I think that's what I'm supposed to do. Okay. Okay. I have cost us so much. No, it's going to cost is. The next two years, couples therapy at $125 a pop, trying to unravel all this mess. Right. Kidding. Kind of. Hey, Maddie, look at me. Look at me. I'm glad you're staying. It's your suitcase. Put it up for you? Sure. Okay. Uh, 
Where do you want me to put it? Oh, um, guest room. Guest room. Yeah. For better, for worse, right? You know, as we watch that video, it points out some of the pain, the suffering, the shame, the guilt, the brokenness, the violation of the soul that happens because of unfaithfulness. Your Heavenly Father knows all of this and is lovingly telling you, telling me, telling everyone, stay away from this. It will surely try to destroy you. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your family. It's a warning from a loving, caring father. You know, I'm sure there are some folks who are watching right now who've been to real rodeos. And you know, for many folks, the biggest highlight of the night is when the rodeo brings out the bull riders. Eight seconds of pure danger and crazy. I can tell you this. A bull rider always knows where the fence is in that arena. Why? Because when that rider gets thrown off, he doesn't want those horns to get him in the gut or hit him in the head. He doesn't want to get stomped on. And I'll tell you, the safest place isn't behind the clown it's on the other side of that fence it's a big tall beautiful fence that when needed you want to be on the other side folks that's what the seventh commandment is all about maybe what we need to do is to view the commandment as a fence that god put it there to keep us safe from all of the pain, all of the brokenness that the beast of adultery wants to bring to your marriage and to your family. And he's telling us, stay out of that arena. It's too dangerous. But what, what if it's too late? And like the video that we just watched, you can more than just relate to that video. Now what? Is your marriage over? Not necessarily. See, this is when it's time to say, I need some help. Why don't you call the church? Why don't you send an email? Why don't you reach out to us? And we'll do everything we can to try to be a blessing and try to help and point you through to the right direction to get you on the right side of the fence. And we can believe God to redeem anything. That's the power of the blood of Jesus. He can redeem anything. You know, it's easy to say, I'm just going to give up. But you know, God says there's something beautiful there. You have every right if there was unfaithfulness. But boy, what a transformation and what a story and a testimony there could be if you allow God to bring healing and wholeness to your marriage. If you want a good, healthy, great marriage, People who have scars in their life, who have had pain in their life, they've learned how to go from here to there by doing a few things. Too many people, when they have pain, they sometimes they just shut down, they don't talk, they isolate, and, and they're, they're just, they've lost hope. But I want to encourage you. This is what great people do. They, number one, they choose to face the pain. And number two, they choose to let God redeem the scars 
of pain in their life, the scars of shame in their life, the scars of guilt in their life. And three, they choose to forgive and to forget. Now, let me be clear what I mean by the word forget. It's not saying that this activity, this act, this sin, this pain didn't happen. It means that you all of a sudden have a transformation in your heart and you no longer view the pain as an emotional rudder that guides your today and your tomorrow. Instead, you look at the event as a historical event that was painful, that happened in your life, but you have moved on. It no longer guides your day, your tomorrow, your next year, or your next. It's now a testimony of victory of what God has done for you because you have forgiven and you have forgotten as in no longer an emotional rudder in your life. It's a historical event that God gets the victory, God gets the glory, and you're moving forward for the cause of Christ. Now let's get back to another reason for God instituting the seventh commandment and it's found in the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, starting at verse 1, we'll go to verse 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God. So do not act like the people in Egypt, where you used to live, or like the people of Canaan, where I am taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. You must obey all my regulations and be careful to obey my decrees. For I am the Lord your God. If you obey my decrees and my regulations, you will find life through them. I am the Lord. As God's chosen people, the Israelites, well, they were to reflect the character of God in the promised land in Canaan. And God didn't want the people emulating the behavior of their past there in Egypt. And He doesn't want them to emulate their future there in Canaan. He had delivered them from that. So He wasn't delivering them to, to do the same thing. The implication here is that there's adultery and it's being done, all the sexual sin is being done in common place, whether it's in Egypt or in Canaan. And God is saying, no, no, let me put a fence around all that. You're to stay away from that. Folks, we're in this world, but we're not to be of this world. We're to follow the words of God, our Heavenly Father. So now, we know what adultery is and why God instituted adultery. Now finally, we need to learn what God meant by the seventh command itself. As with all the commandments, there are things we need to avoid. Here, clearly, it's, well, to avoid committing adultery. And then there's things to do. And that's the positive part. The negative part, don't commit adultery. However, there's more to this command. The simple avoidance of extramarital relationship. And I might add something here. It's not just physical. It's emotional as well. Not just a physical affair. There can be an emotional affair without physicality. And that's still an affair. That's still adultery. That heart of yours belongs to your spouse and your spouse only. Don't give it up. In this seventh commandment, one can make the argument and wrap it up in the prohibition of all sorts of sexual sin. Incest, fornication, homosexuality, bestiality, any sexual sin. And the argument can be made if you were to go in, and I don't have time for this, but in Leviticus 18, it speaks to all this. So please, Let's not play the game of how close can we get to the edge of a cliff without falling over. The truth is, is we need to build a big, tall, beautiful, strong fence 
that would keep us away from that edge. It's not worth it. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, He really dealt with the issue of the heart in regards to this commandment. So let's go to Matthew chapter 5, start at verse 27 to 30. And Jesus says, You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. 28, but I say. God, Jesus is speaking in pure authority right now. Anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 30. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Again, Jesus brings the Ten Commandments to not just the outward behavior or that physical act, but He brings it to the issue of the heart. He zeroes in right at the center of our core values. What is in your heart? Now, be honest with yourself. If you knew that you knew that you knew that no one would know and you could get away with it, would you do it? You're probably asking, what are you talking about? (laughs) That thing, that secret, that thing of the flesh. Folks, that is what God is pointing at in you and in me. He wants you to be aware that the real beast that needs to be brought to the cross is our flesh. Here are three reasons to be faithful to your spouse. Number one, you love Jesus Christ. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Number two, you love your spouse and children. The thought of hurting them is, should be unbearable to you. Number three, you fear the judgment of the Lord. The Bible says adulterers and fornicators, God will judge. Now, of course, there might be some people who will say, well, I can do what I want to do. It's my life. I can live it any way I want to and do whatever I want to, whenever I want to, however I want to. Now, if there's a sign on a big, beautiful, tall fence that says, do not enter, I'm going to get in there anyways, especially if I can get away with it. I mean, if God says don't commit adultery, it's really none of God's business. It's my life, not His. (laughs) It's scary how the enemy of our souls is able to so deceive us. If that's you, please know that truth is truth even when you don't want it to be or even if you don't understand it to be. It's still truth. Truth. God loves you even if you don't understand His love for you. Truth. God does not want you or those that you care about to suffer because of sin. Truth. God paid the price for your freedom and your salvation with His Son on the cross. You are precious to Him. So you are truly His business and His passion. Folks, to our Heavenly Father, marriage is so incredibly important. Because God knows that the home and the church are the two institutions ordained by God on earth to visibly display and model the love of God to a lost world. There's a legend that speaks about a certain isolated island in the Pacific. Now, when a young man wanted to propose marriage, it was customary to go to the village and to announce to the entire village his proposal to a certain woman. 
Then he and the whole community would go to the young woman's home and there find the father and they would go outside and then in front of all the community, the father and the groom-to-be would barter, so to speak. Now, now, the main item of value in this island were its cows. Everybody needed cows. Therefore, the groom-to-be would offer the father of the bride to be married based on how many cows he could offer. On an average, marriage were maybe two cows. Three if they were maybe attractive. Four if they were just over the top. That hardly ever happened for cows. Never. The most eligible and very successful bachelor of the island was a guy by the name of Johnny Lingo. Now, Johnny was handsome and he was wealthy. And and imagine all the excitement among the women of the island when Johnny announced he was going to get married. And then they all headed over to this one little hut. It's there that the father came out and he asked for his bride-to-be by the name of Sarita. Now, you got to know a little bit about Sarita. She was homely. Very plain. Her shoulders just humped over. She had bad posture. Everybody just looked at her as one of the guys who was joking in the back says, I think he's going to have to give Johnny Lingo one or two cows to take that daughter of his. But then the business of the bride came to be. And Johnny Lingo started off with his offer. And he offered eight cows. It was double the most that anybody had ever paid. Sarita didn't know what to do. The father was almost going to collapse. He barely got the word yes out. That night they were married. And that night after they were married, they were able to go to an adjacent island where johnny lingo lived and they stayed there for a good year and on their one year anniversary they came back to the island to see their family and their friends and to celebrate their one year anniversary and as they did everybody ran to the dock to greet them and everybody says you got to see you got to see him you got to see him and nobody was bothering to look at johnny lingo But everybody was talking about Sarita. Can you believe it? I didn't recognize her. She's too beautiful. Who is she? And then the word got out. It's Sarita. She was poised. She was beautiful. She was stunning and gorgeous. And she walked with such grace, humility. And everybody was screaming and celebrating the joy of seeing Sarita. Well, as the night got to close and they wanted to go back to their home, one of Johnny Lingo's best friends growing up came over to him. And he said, Johnny, I want to know the secret of this amazing transformation in Sarita. How did it happen? And here's what Johnny Lingo said. From the time Sarita was born, she had been treated as though she was not valuable or worthy of very much. Like anyone, she began to believe that about herself. But I announced to the whole village that she was an eight-cow marriage. Double that than anybody else had ever paid for a bride. And she began to see things and herself differently. What you see today is just the reflection of what I have always seen in her. And now she has accepted the truth of who she really is. The Lord has committed to you as well. He has chosen you and He has purchased you. 
And it wasn't with livestock. It was with a payment beyond price or comprehension. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Folks, I'm sure some may feel unworthy because as we go through these commandments, you may have a tendency to see yourself as failing here and failing there and coming up short here and coming up short there. And maybe like Sarita, you see yourself as unworthy, as one who has little to give or to offer or any kind of value. Well, I have some some really good news. The Bible calls the church the bride of Christ. And Jesus wants the whole world to know just how much He paid for you. He gave all He had just for you. The question is, are you willing to receive and to believe what He has always seen and believed about you? What a transformation awaits you if you will believe. Father, we thank You for Your goodness and Your grace. Lord, how serious the seventh commandment is. And Father, how serious You are in offering us forgiveness and hope and a future. A transformation. For Lord, You didn't, you didn't offer eight cows. You offered Your only begotten Son, the perfect, innocent Lamb of God, that we might have life everlasting with You. Oh, Father, I pray blessing on Your people. I pray that they would embrace Your forgiveness, Your grace, and Your mercy. They would reach out for help when they need it. And Father, they would know greater is He that's in us than He that's in this world. Oh, Father, set the captive free. I pray blessing on marriages, Lord. Whether they're young marriages or old marriages, I pray you would touch them and bless them. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. God bless you, church.